I feel like just especially in like Haudenosaunee spaces, and I'm sure in many others, there's just like a very rich history of storytelling, being a part of culture and a part of communicating and sharing things. I'm Lo Harris, and you're tuning into One on One with Lo, where I bring in folks from various creative communities to engage in uplifting conversations around how we can show up in our work as our authentic selves. Enjoy the conversation. Erica is a Seneca Cayuga uh, American writer and director who is passionate about using storytelling as a way to share knowledge and to tell important stories and to share ideas. And Erica, you're a seasoned storyteller, and you've worked on a variety of documentary and narrative film projects. Uh, your short films and features such as Little Chief and Fancy Dance have been recognized by all of these various film institutions like Sundance and IFC. And uh, more recently, you stepped into this world of television, which is super cool, where you just finished writing and directing an episode of Reservation Dogs and FX, which is super cool. And correct me if I'm wrong, but you're currently working on a project right now uh, with George R. R. Martin. Is that right? Uh, yeah. Well, actually, it's um, it was a series on a or it is a series that's premiering on AMC in June. Uh, and George R. R. Martin, Robert Redford were the executive producers. So yeah, that was um, that was the first television writers' room that I was in. Uh, and it'll be exciting to see to see all the hard work of the writers room, uh, you know, on screen in June. Yay! Oh, that's so amazing. And it's so amazing to really watch. Uh, for I kind of want to give folks a background of how we know each other. <laughs> uh, so when I met you, I was an intern. And you were the big boss. I was an intern at Bustle. You were killing the game. I was an intern at Bustle. And you were the director of video for Bustle. And I was super nervous when I first joined the team, but I was immediately kind of disarmed and floored by the environment that you fostered, that was fostered under your leadership. And that was actually my first and sadly my only time working consistently on production sets that were primarily female run, female and non-binary producers, editors, graphic artists, like PAs. And it's kind of insane how rare that I didn't realize that was my first production experience really on set. And I just was thinking, wow, like set is great. I didn't realize that seeing all of these like women and non-binary folks together in these roles was such a rarity. And the environment that you curated to kind of make that happen was astounding. You were doing some really special work there. Um, so I just want to say like, you're a phenomenal leader. And I would like to give you <laughs> some room stop shaking your head you are i would like to give you <laughs> i came here to like give you a honey roast where i basically just like honey roast you and so you just like <laughs> i wasn't ready for this <laughs> this is a honey this is an ambush uh for me to aggressively compliment you but i gave a brief intro already but i would love for you to introduce yourself to the audience in your own words and 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 really just like explain like the trajectory of your career because i feel like between editorial video for digital documentary indie films major tv shows it seems like you've lived so many lives in the visual storytelling world and it's remarkable that i met you in a completely different context than kind of the work that you're doing right now so can you really string together for us uh your career and uh you know has your intention always been to move into tv and writing and narrative film explain that uh yeah well first of all i just want to say that um when you came to intern at bustle i remember i don't know if you were i think you were standing around but i remember juliana and i being like she's definitely going to be our boss someday um, so while you're calling me the big boss, like we, I, I distinctively remember a memory where we're like, uh, Lauren is definitely going to be our boss someday. And I'm, I'm, I'm ready for that. Um, so I'm just delighted to be here uh, and chat with you today. Uh, I am a member of the Seneca Cuga Nation. Um, I grew up um, near our reservation lands in uh, southwest Missouri and Oklahoma. Um, I, I guess to give the like shortened version of the tra shortened version of the trajectory of how I got where I'm at, 
Um, I was always interested in storytelling. I loved listening to my aunties and uncles and my mom sit around and tell stories over the holidays. And the, the things would always change. And it wasn't as if they were lying. They were just kind of like <laughs> changing the moral of the, of the story would change depending on who the audience was. And I was always just like deeply impressed by um, people in my community that were able to kind of like hold court and have everyone listening to them. And, and um, I was like, that's so like, amazing. Like I want to be, I, I would hardly even listen to the stories at some point, but just watching their mannerisms and thinking yeah. like, but I get to be in that position someday. Um, and I think it was around junior high age that I convinced my mom to buy me a, um, <clears throat> a VHS recorder um, and at, at a local Goodwill. And I kind of became the bossy neighbor girl that was like forcing all of the neighborhood kids and my friends to be in my plays. And, um, you know, I was famous for recording trampoline routines uh, on our trampoline. And it's funny because we just got those tapes out to go to digitize them. And I was not a great filmmaker uh, in junior <laughs> high. There was like, you know, so far away from the subjects, there's like a lot, someone mowing their lawn in the background. Um, can't I love that. Of, that's just, that's just scenery noise. <laughs> can't hear any of the dialogue. Um, but I think just the exercise of working and collaborating with all of the neighbor kids and then just like falling in love with television. Like we didn't really have cable as I was growing up. But um, we had a family friend that would send us v like again VHS tape tapes. They would just put the tape in and like record MTV or record television and then mail yeah. them to us. And we would just sit and watch those videos for hours and hours and hours. And I would just like watch a certain music video and just dissect it because that was like what I had to watch. And so I was always just really enamored by um, the art of, of telling story through, you know, video uh, of, you know, that visual format. And so I went to college. I was really lucky enough to get a, a full ride scholarship to um, a state school in Missouri, Southwest Missouri State University. Um, and they didn't have a, like a traditional film school. Um, so I um, just got a media studies degree and, um, you know, just tried to like align myself as close to the things that I wanted to do. At the time, I thought maybe I was going to be a journalist, but then I, you know, mm -hmm. Journalism is always the gateway. That's the gateway to everything else. Like everyone is always a journalism major and then they don't do journalism. Yeah, but I mean, even, and then I, you know, I've worked on some documentary films as well, but as I've, as I've kind of like worked in the journalism sphere, I just realized like, I want to be the person that gets to change the truth to like suit my needs. And so it's like, I quickly realized that I'm not a great documentary filmmaker. I'm not a great journalist. <laughs> And that's okay. Like, that's not necessarily what my calling was. Like, I'm more interested mm -hmm. in how you can take characters and create stories. And I want to make things up. And so, um, you know, I moved out to LA um, with like $2,000. I remember thinking, <clears throat> if I can save up $2,000, I can make it in LA. <laughs> I look back mm -hmm. on that now and I was like, wow, you really had a lot of guts. Like, I certainly wouldn't have the... the um, the belief to do in myself to do that now but I moved out to LA I started working in PA jobs working as a production assistant um but I um I've always kind of like struggled with autoimmune disease and and I mm -hmm. realized that I needed health care like health coverage at the time I didn't realize like everyone should have health coverage I was just like well I guess I can't have this dream of being a filmmaker because you can't do any of the entry-level jobs like you just don't have health coverage so I got an yeah. entry entry-level position um, in a production capacity at an advertising agency uh, in, in El Segundo. And it was really there over the next several years that I built an, uh, a career in production. So I was working in digital production and video production at various um, advertising agencies, working for like Kia Motors and Bank of America and some mm -hmm. really large clients. Um, and then I ended up on the East Coast and there was still this, and I had this great job, great, you know, kind of career, but there was just still this nagging um, dream in the back of my head that I wanted to be a filmmaker. So I was making documentaries on the side and I'm super grateful to all of the people who, you know, worked on those with me, but I still, 
and I was learning about story and I was like honing the craft, but I still wasn't being kind of fulfilled. Like I want to be a writer director. It's what I've wanted to be since the VHS recorder in junior high. And it's still what I want to be. So I kind of thought maybe if I made a jump from advertising to publishing, that would maybe get me a little bit closer. Because all along the way, I was raising my hand. I want to be a creative director. I want to be a copywriter. But the doors were really not open for me, even though I kind of had some success with the doc films or whatever nobody would like I remember specifically asking like I will take a half pay reduction to just be an mm -hmm. entry-level copywriter but no one said yes so mm -hmm. I was like okay well maybe if I transition into publishing so I moved to New York City I started working um in a you know as a creative video uh, in creative develop creative video development um I worked at the Hearst Corporation, um, helping run a large team for all of the digital output of Marie Claire, Harper's Bazaar, Esquire. And that was great because it was finally, I was on the side of the line where we were, we were, um, I was part of the brainstorming process and part yes. of coming up with the creative. Okay, okay well, yes. for Esquire, what about this series? Let's do a dance series on this, let's do whatever. And so then I made my way over to Bustle where I ran the video team there. And, you know, we made a lot of really great series there. But even in that capacity, as I was getting closer to being somewhat in um, a part of the process of the creative, writing and directing just seems still like yeah. that's what I want to do. And it kept, it kept resurfacing. The closer that I got to it, the more that I realized that that really was my dream and my passion. <clears throat> so... I wrote a short film, I submitted it to the Sundance Native um, Lab, ran by Bird Running Water at the time, and I got in. And that's while I was still at Bustle. And um, I, I love, I, 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 it's great to hear you talk about your experience at Bustle. And, and I think like, you know, I'm always fully transparent about things. It was really difficult <laughs> working in the industry and trying to create a team that I thought reflected um, who I thought should be on a team. Yeah. It was a constant battle and a constant battle over like what stories we should, what stories yeah. we should do and what I thought, you know, was our a kind of ethical obligation in journalism. Absolutely. Well, can I just say like what you were doing in your capacity at that time is I think that you were doing what people think that they're doing when they talk about diversity and, cl and inclusion. Diversity and inclusion isn't just taking marginalized identities and dropping them into these like still very like white priority spaces and forcing them to re-traumatize themselves by trying to fit into these various constraints and boxes. Diversity and inclusion is building a team and then really building content around that team as well. And like the authentic authenticity that they can bring to that process. And I feel like I understand why it was difficult, right? Because it was like, you were doing the thing. And like, I think that's the thing that people, the big execs get uncomfortable with. Like they're like, oh, we want brown faces and queer faces and these folks working in, in our organization because it looks good for us. But do we really want to go the next step and actually let them have voice? that isn't heavily edited and monitored by this greater system that just wants them to kind of stay in their place. Um, so I understand exactly why that would be a difficult thing to maintain, like that you're like going against the grain there. Yeah, and I think that like, even with the stories that our team is very passionate about telling, I remember that this was like kind of after the Me Too movement had started getting some momentum. And I remember sitting in a meeting and we had a series around um, searching for missing people um, mm -hmm. from from various um, you know backgrounds, people who were missing. And I just remember one of them, like there was like a sexual assault involved in one of the cases or something. I just remember sitting there listening, saying, "Well, nobody is going to want to put advertising around a story about rape." And I'm just sitting there, and I'm like, "But we're supposed to be this like feminist publication. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to be telling stories, and like you're just worried mm -hmm. about selling advertising." And so. It was a pretty difficult place to be in terms of how do I move <clears throat> the needle forward or how do we, <clears throat> excuse me, put Certainly. out stories that, um, that are important. Um, but, but alas, I think that, that when I got that, that fellowship with Sundance, I really realized that kind of going back to community and I was being introduced to all of these incredible indigenous filmmakers that I didn't even know existed 
and seeing how um, how wonderful how, how so, there was so much wonderful work being created by all of these wonderful people, and so I um, kind of just took a chance on um, myself and also just like wanted to immerse myself back in culture. Like I'd always gone home back to home where where I'm from and. Um, you know, it was very closely tied to family and, and my community in those ways. But um, I, I, um, I moved to a, a, a reserve in Canada called Six Nations and enrolled in a three year long language immersion program. Yeah, kind of simultaneously to making Little Chief and um, like embarking on this, like, I was like, okay, if I'm gonna do this, I want to be able to like, be as authentic in telling my stories as possible, but also like, how can I use my storytelling as a way to um, do something for my community? Mm -hmm. I think I was a little mm -hmm. bit like scarred from the experience that I'd had in advertising and publishing. And I was like, well, I don't want to not tell these important stories because of like how, mm -hmm. how like sellable a product is. Um, and so I, you know, I wrote, we, I wrote a feature film right after fans or right after Little Chief had been um, uh, had premiered at Sundance and I got reps very quickly. I got repped at William Morris. I got a manager and then things really just kind of like started to explode at that point. Um, I was um, getting all of these meetings for different writers rooms and um, and yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's just been a couple of years now and it's happening all during the pandemic that I've been working in these spaces. Um, but I'm so grateful um, to the opportunity. I've now been in two writers rooms that are all native writers, all indigenous writers, which is incredible. Um, yes. I'm, just, I'm just coming off of reservation dogs where I was on set directing an episode with so many incredible indigenous creators led by Sterling Harjo and um, it's kind of starting to feel like all of these like dreams that I had are possible. Um, it's not always easy and it's hard and there's like challenges, but, um, but yeah, I mean, that's kind of like the long winded trajectory and it's, it's, it's easy to sit up here and talk about all the successes and all of the things that, um, oh, and I got this fellowship and then I got repped and then I did this. But like, I think it's also important to, to just talk about, um, how many no's there are along the way. Yeah. And that yeah. rejection is just consistently happening all the time. And that yes. um, I'm, I'm not like, you know, some sort of prodigy or it doesn't happen easy like that. Like there's, it's... you're just consistently dealing with rejection. And I think for whatever reason, um, I've always just wanted to do this so badly that I was looking for any little like, you know, hole to slither through to get to the other side. And I'm um, so grateful for everyone who helped me get where I'm at. And there's such an incredible amount of young indigenous filmmakers that are coming up in the labs now that I'm so in awe of. And just like you, they are the boss and will be the boss of me very soon. <laughs> and, you know, I just, um, I, I, you know, I, um, yeah, I, I'm just grateful uh, for where I'm at right now and hope to be able to use the stuff that I'm working on and the films that I'm making to, um, you know, spark some sort of conversation that um, um, that will be either inspiring or informative or, you know, whatever. Yes. Well, thank you so much for stringing that all together, because I think that seeing the big picture of everything is super important. Like, I agree with you on the point of rejection. Like, it took me, I mean, I was always so like I had all of these random skills in college. Like I taught myself how to do motion design. I was super interested in design and I, I tried to like really loop it into the things that I was doing. But I often found myself being so scared of my own voice and my own vision and not having the confidence and being able to pursue it on my own terms that I would constantly try to do work like to help other people with their projects. I was constantly supporting other people with their vision and with their projects. And whenever I'd kind of start to raise a voice and be like, but what if I'll, I would face that rejection? You know, I was once told by, like I asked the boss about being on camera and I was once told by that boss, like, well, like, you know, the people who are on camera, like they have the look, you know, like they, they look good, like they're what sells. And like, that was like, you know, to me, so for me, it's, it's hyper rebellious for me to say, I'm just gonna get on Instagram live then I'm gonna host my own thing and I'm gonna be my own anchor, right? And I, another thing that stuck out to me, and this is a little bit farther back in what you were saying, is uh, when you were talking about how your interests betrayed themselves to you 
as, as so young, so young, and how it kept really popping up. I mean, I relate to that so much because I remember, like, when I was in in um, elementary school, like, I would get, I hated busy work. I hated busy work, and sometimes I'd kind of get my desk mates to do these little projects with me where I would be obsessed with flipping through magazines. So I would say, like, hey, let, let's draw our own magazine. And mind you, like, I had these kids on assembly line, like, drawing on pieces <laughs> of A4 printer paper, drawing Dasani bottle ads and mac and cheese ads. And like, not even really, there was no editorial content. It was all ads that we were just drawing. And then the teacher was just so just like, pleased with us just finding something to do that was creative and not talking. They were like, you can just skip the busy work and you could do this all day. Like, I, I love those makeshift projects. Like, I love kind of bringing folks together and bringing teams together. And that's something that has kind of kept popping up in my life as well. And when you keep getting those signals, you know, I think it's important for people to recognize that, hey, like, I think that I should maybe take a take a chance on myself. I keep getting these signals, like music keeps coming back into my life. Art keeps coming back into my life. Film keeps coming back into my life. Maybe I should just bite the bullet and do it. Um, and so I really appreciate you sharing all of that. And another thing that I, I actually wanted to ask more about is the element of just homegrown storytelling and your uncles, your aunties, your mom. What do you think made them so compelling, the story so compelling? Like, what would you say is the secret sauce to being a good storyteller? I mean, that's such a good question. I, I don't know. I mean, I feel like, um, I feel like just especially in like Haudenosaunee spaces, and I'm sure in many others, there's just like, um, uh, a very rich history of storytelling being a part of culture and a part of communicating and sharing things like all of the stories that we've passed down over generation over generation over generation are all meant to teach something or to inspire something and so I'm just always so inspired sitting around and in Haudenosaunee spaces because everyone is a storyteller in their own way and they're always sharing and you know I don't know what it is. I think um, uh, it's par partially part of just trying to connect with someone and mm -hmm. um, finding a way to do that. And whether it's in, you know, changing your voice or like I said, mannerisms or the way yeah. you create intrigue or build tension before like you, you have the exposition and the plot. Like, yes. I mean, it could be my uncle could come back from the grocery store and tell a story that just happened at the grocery store and you're sitting there on the edge of your seat and you're like okay uncle's clearly <laughs> making half of this up but it's still intriguing and interesting and he's teaching something or he's like sharing something or you know I think um a lot of it also comes down to um 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 like what it is like what like uh, what what am I trying to say here I think I think a lot of it also comes down to um, like what you're trying to pass on or like what your goal is mm -hmm. to communicate with someone and also like trying to get a rise out of people is just constantly teasing and yeah. constantly trying to like put someone on blast and like that becomes competitive and then everyone's trying to outdo the other. And so I think mm -hmm. that like just learning from that, it was great to watch. And, you know, I have this, um, people ask me sometimes where my ideas come from. And I have this like little Google doc that I keep a hold of. And it's, um, I write down like all the stories that I tell at like cocktail parties or like, you know, out with friends. And I, I think like, you know, if this is an interesting enough story to tell to a group of friends, then I'm going to put it on the sheet. And then sometimes when I have writer's block, I'll go to that. And I'll like, tr like, you know, my short film, Little Chief is like two of those stories connected together. My mom taught at the school. I witnessed this thing happen. But then I also remember telling the story of my uncle never wanting to buy ice when we would go camping. <laughs> so he would yeah. stop at a hotel and we would sneak into the hotel and fill up the cooler. And so it's like those stories are sometimes things that I go to whenever I have writer's block. Um, because at the end of the day, it's all about entertaining people and like, Absolutely. If you engage with them. Um, so I don't know what the secret sauce is, but I think everyone has stories to tell mm -hmm. and everyone has like those, those memories or those like family lore that they tell over and over again. And there's a reason why you tell the stories over and over again. And it's yes. because you're getting a response from the other side. 
And if you're getting a response from the other side, then it may just be the, the you know, the kernel of inspiration for your short story or your short film or your doc or whatever it exactly. is. Exactly. And you really just actually answered my next question because I was going to ask you, you know, I'm, I'm hearing about your family and their stories and the embellishments and the gestures and the mannerisms and the energy. I'm reminded so much about how what I know about my own family and my own family history is so informed by oral tradition. And it's often told, like, I think oral tradition builds charisma, right? And you perfectly explained, like, what significance oral traditions, like, kind of holds and fit holds to you personally and where it fits into your workflow. You keep that Google Doc, you kind of find ways to implement and combine these stories and create this like Frankenstein experience of all of these stories. And in many ways, you know, like oral storytelling is so amazing because it offers a super accessible way for people and for communities to really own and to have control over their own narratives, especially marginalized folks, you know, who might not have the representation in popular media to really communicate those stories authentically. So it, it makes total sense that, you know, oral tradition really fits into your workflow as a storyteller. And I think that this is a wonderful segue into my next uh, kind of point that I'd like to ask you about, which is all about kind of rewriting cultural narratives, because you did mention that you're super passionate about telling great stories from your community, emphasis on community for me. Could you talk a bit about like what your work aims to contribute culturally, specifically with respect to your identity uh, as a member of the Seneca Cayuga? Did I say that correctly? You did. Yeah, yeah. I, was, I was practicing <laughs> um, as, a, as a member of the Seneca Cayuga tribe. I think, honestly, like all of my practice, I think lifelong comes back to community and come back, comes back to where I'm from. I think I was raised by just an incredible matriarch. She's my muse. She's the person I love most in this world. And I think that... Um, um, I'm constantly inspired by, um, like her survivance, if that's a word. And um, it feels right. It feels like a good <laughs> word. <laughs> um, we might have created a new word right here, but I'm sure someone, you know, much more comfortable than I did has probably already created that word. But anyway, I just really am incredibly inspired by the matriarchs that are in my community. And I've always, mm -hmm. um, I just always want, they, they're the hardest women to impress. <laughs> they're mm -hmm. constantly like on you to do better, be better. And I've just spent my entire life wanting to impress my mother, wanting to impress my aunties, wanting to do right by what they've taught me over the years and what they've struggled through and what they've gotten through. And um, <clears throat> to be able to like see all of their hard work and like keeping me alive and on track to see all of their hard work flourish is like truly like been the guiding light for me my entire life. I think it's the reason why I'm constantly getting in trouble for raising my hand and being like, that's not right, you know, and working in these spaces that are um, sometimes just so toxic and steeped with racism and with patriarchy and misogyny. And I, I just can't stand it. I mean, I'm just like, I was constantly trying to be better myself to try and like make spaces better and no one's perfect. And I'm constantly learning and trying to grow. Um, but I, I think it's all because I want to, I want to do right by all of the things that, that my, my family and generations before me have gotten through to get me to being alive and sitting here right now. And I feel like, a, Oh, great. Mm -hmm debt of gratitude to to that and so for me um i when i went and started to study language <clears throat> i knew immediately what that meant you can't i mean our language only has you know has less than 20 speakers left and i knew that if wow. i if i had been gifted that knowledge any knowledge at all that it was part of my responsibility to give it back in some way or to be a part of the revitalization effort. Now, unlike my mother and my sister, I'm a terrible teacher. <laughs> like I would not be a great teacher, but one thing that I can do um, is make media, uh, make mm -hmm. films. 
And so mm-hmm. um, right now I'm, um, you know, fundraising and, and, and we're getting close to financing um, my feature film Fancy Dance, which is 20 to 30 percent in Cayuga. So hopefully there will be a film made that has modern day Native Americans speaking the language yes. fluently. Um, and so my, my practice is always grounded in how can, how can this beautiful um, storytelling practice be what it always has been for my community, which mm-hmm. is a way to share knowledge and a way to pass on stories and um, be a tool for people to live with, a, you know, what we call as Haudenosaunee, a good mind. And so yes. I think that that's constantly what I'm trying to do is have a good mind and figure out how to instill my work with thoughts from my good mind, ideas and stories from that mind, and inspire that into people who are engaging with the work. Um, and so I just think all of it's grounded in that. You know, I, I live here on my traditional ancestral lands in upstate New York on Cayuga Lake. And daily I go on my walk and daily I'm trying to consider what it means to be on this land when most of my relatives don't have the privilege of being here. Consider how to like think about what land back means, what to think about what it means to be a white native, to think about privilege, to think about all of these things. Um, and you know, it's, um, it's, it's work. It's just constantly doing work. But I think mm-hmm. um, I would be cheating myself and cheating my community if, if, if culture and community wasn't the cornerstone of my craft and practice. That's beautiful. Yes, absolutely. Like that. I mean, but that that's beautiful. And it's to me, I mean, hearing, I mean, it was a shock to to hear there are less than 20 speakers like left. Like that's wild to me. And, and, you know, so often indigenous folks are really misrepresented in the media through these two dimensional characters or through a lack of visi- visibility of indigenous folks and indigenous protagonists in contemporary settings, in contemporary stories. And so it's really cool to me that you use like the inclusion of Cayuga as a language being spoken in this contemporary sense as an intentional um, choice that you're making as a director and as a writer to to really go about challenging that narrative. That's really awesome. And it's a really cool way that you work that into your practice as a writer and as a director. And um, another thing I'd love to ask you about, I mean, you've said that authenticity is the cornerstone to any good story. And I feel like so many people really struggle to fully embrace their authentic energy or their authentic stories for fear of being misunderstood or judged or making themselves uncomfortable in the process of learning that. And, you know, hearing about like your experience at Six Nations and the language immersion program, um, you know, that's such a cool thing. I remember kind of watching you do via social. Like I I saw that you had like moved and like you were like learning all these new things. And, uh, you know, watching this, watching you do this was so cool because you were willing to challenge and to push yourself to engage in your identity in a way that you might not have gotten to before. So do you have uh, any tips for folks who are looking to rediscover or really looking to figure out how they can fully express themselves in their art, but are probably holding back because they're just scared of stepping out. They're scared of making mistakes. They're scared of being different. Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing is just to like, you know, make it clear that it's hard. I think a lot of times we're fed this like idea that like, oh, like it's the American dream. You just like want it and it just appears in front of you and you work hard enough. And like, it's actually really like difficult to to break through when the world is kind of against what you're trying to do. Like if you're trying to tell an indigenous story in a in a in a in the Cayuga language, well, nobody really wants to make that. There's, it's not a project that's gonna make make a bunch of money or like sell. And it's like because there haven't been a lot of like films centered around native protagonists in the past. People are like, well, we don't have any comps to compare it. Like, how do we know it will make money? And like, I think part of it's just like 
that that little voice that's inside of you or the that nagging feeling that this is something that you want to do just keep doing it and mm -hmm. i think like it's maybe a little bit um um i mean sometimes when i when i give that piece of advice i also always want to follow it up by saying that like oftentimes it's a great privilege to just keep doing something because it costs money for supplies it costs money for like you know video equipment or whatever it is but i think that if it's possible to find anything that tangentially bumps up against the thing that is your dream just keep pushing them toward that like mm -hmm. the vhs recorder or getting a job that somehow is loosely aligned with the thing that you want to do and I don't think that that's easy for everyone and maybe it's not even accessible for everyone. But I think at any time that you can continue to work on your craft and hone in on your craft, whether it's writing, you just sit down and you keep writing and you share things on Reddit or you find a group of like-minded people that you can share your work with. I think that the answer to everything for me is always um, um, collaborative and community-based in, in essence. So I think like j just keep pushing and finding people around you that are interested in the same things. When I was coming up, I had a group of friends and we would just volunteer for each other on the weekends. And we would do my little video project one weekend and someone else's video project the next weekend. And we would volunteer our time for each other. And what's so great about that practice is just again, like the collaboration aspect like, yeah, you're the director, but you're nothing without everyone else that's helping make decisions and helping inform things along the way. And so I think whether you're a painter or a graphic designer or, a, you know, you want to make video content or you want to, like, find other people who are in the same spot as you and support each other. And maybe someone breaks and then you have this contact and this person or maybe no one ever breaks but at least you have this space where you get to go and authentically create the thing that your heart is telling you to create. Um, so I don't know if that's a nothing answer, um, but I, I do think I, just pushing yourself and continuing to make and just finding your, your peers and collaborators. Absolutely. I think continuing, continuing to make and continuing to really focus on what you're doing and like where you're going and how you're doing it and how you yourself can be a better storyteller as yourself and not trying to emulate or fit yourself into the into a box of anyone else is a very good strategy it's very difficult and it's like it takes a lot of uh stamina to just like keep that positive energy uh but that i completely agree with you and i would like to uh open the chat up for a q and a i forgot to mention earlier there is typically a q and a um towards the end of the conversation so if there's anyone in the audience who has any questions for erica questions for both of us like like please like drop them in and i'll just start with my own question which has been uh erica what has been uh, some of your favorite projects to work on or what has been like your most, your most impactful project. Uh, I guess I would, I would say like a project that really stuck in your brain and left a huge imprint on you while we wait for uh, audience members to also offer questions if they have any. Oh, well, I think, um, although it never aired, I feel like the, I really, oh, I think a lot about the project at Bustle that I would mentioned earlier, the search. Um, I also, um, I, I mean, I guess there's just like a piece of every project that has like a, a fond place in, in my heart. I mean, obviously working on Reservation Dogs has been completely transformative. Um, you know, what Sterling Harjo has created with um, this series that FX and, and the entire cast and all of the amazing writers that I've been able to learn from and look up to and then getting to direct an episode was 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 just such an incredible experience. Um, but I also think it's just like the smaller things like outside of just the project like um, um, living up in Six Nations near um, this incredible um, Haudenosaunee filmmaker Zoe Hopkins and 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 just being in her space and going out and eating village pizza with her and talking to her about craft. I think for me again, it's like it's always about what those relationships are like with other people and how we're pushing each other forward. That, that, that is what in, stays in my mind. 
Um, and for me, it, it, yes, the product of what you make is really important. But for me, it's all about the process. <laughs> and the process mm -hmm. is what leaves its mark on me. Um, and so right now I'm working on my feature film Fancy Dance with my incredible producing partner, Deidre Bax, who I just... Um, she's, we've just been working and grinding out in this industry for so many years together. And, you know, we have our conversations hours at a time where we're talking about how we're going to get something done. And, um, I just love working with people. <laughs> like, yeah, I love working. People are amazing. <laughs> Yeah. And I mean, I, I also like deal with assholes all the time. And that's like memorable as well. And like, how do you deal with like a person who's just like being completely impossible to work with? Or like, you know, mm -hmm. I, 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 um, I don't know, it's hard to pinpoint just a specific project, because I feel like even going back mm -hmm. to when I was, you know, making these trampoline routines as a kid, all of that work and all of the things that I've ever done are important, not only in my own journey as a storyteller or a filmmaker, but I think just every time you create something or make something, it just like leaves its, its little mark, you know, on the world, even if only yeah. two people ever have seen it. Um, and so people, I, be working with people is like such a I mean, like people really make the experience like one of the best pieces of advice I ever got was actually from Stephanie from Bustle and Stephanie I think Leisha also said so as well. I think both of them said, like, it's always like, you know, people will always remember when you're a pleasure to work with. And that has stuck with me um, for a while because, you know, like, it's just like, you can't, like, you could be the most talented person. And if it was just like a terrible time working with you, like, people are going to learn something from that. <laughs> and it's yeah. going to be an entire, uh, an entire fiasco. Uh, we do have an audience, uh, an audience question in if you're ready for that. That. I can get it up on screen. So the question is, when you have a lot of ideas, how do you prioritize or focus on uh, which to work on? Um, well, thank you for that question. It's a very hard question to answer because I think um, it's a very common problem to have, at least for me. Like currently right now, I'm working on four projects, five projects, if you count one other. And it's really hard to compartmentalize the projects and compartmentalize your brain. Um, I think for me, I, I'm the type of creative that when I'm working on one thing, my brain wants to have these like big ideas, like has these mm -hmm. big ideas and wants to like think of any other project except for the project that I'm working on. Uh, so I force myself, um, I'm a very unorganized person most of the time, but one of the things that I've been really forcing myself to do lately is creating like calendars for myself where you go on my calendar and you see, um, okay, these three days I'm allotting to reservation dogs. These three days I'm allotting mm -hmm. to my feature. These three days, and I like parse out my days and then I, ma I make sure to take days off because you can start to just be so busy that everything blends in and you actually do need a day to let your brain just like watch um, the bachelor or whatever, and like, just like mm -hmm. decompress. Um, and so, um, I think it's all about like organizing, but then there are some days where I'm sitting and working on something and the other project just keeps knocking and keeps coming back. And so I'll be like, okay, I'm going to swap days because clearly my brain only wants to go right on this other thing. And I'll, sw I'll switch projects. Um, but I think, um, um, it's a good problem to have so many ideas and have so many projects to work on. So I will never complain about it, but I do think that it takes a bit of practice to learn how to um, um, make sure that you don't just completely implode <laughs> with all of the pressures yeah. and projects that you have. Oh yeah. Uh, I agree with that. Retweet that. I, <laughs> Like sometimes when there are like so many projects and I have like, I mean, actually I got an assistant <laughs> to like help me because like I have like different things. I'm like, what if we did this? What if we did that? And then I think I get paralyzed by the logistics of, all right, well, I know if I do this, I'm going to have to make a whole new graphics template and I can do that. But then I got to like post it and I got to come up with witty things and witty ways to do all this. And like, it can be paralyzing. So I feel like 
really having community uh, and creativity is like a really cool thing. Like any time that I can find a way to collaborate with a creative friend who's like a photographer or a video editor or whatever, I like to like try to loop them in and, you know, get them, you know, into it too, because I think that I, I'm a very teams oriented person. And I think that I can really help prior it, it helps me pr in prioritizing when I like involve like other people and like gather people together. Um, I would like to start the wrap up. Uh, and I want to thank you, Erica, so much for joining me today and for giving me some time out of your day. Um, and I'd love if you could just share with the audience uh, your upcoming projects, how they can check them out, what episodes, <laughs> like if, if you know the number, you know, so that they can come in and also let us know, like, how can we support you? How can we support your work? How can we support the work that you're doing and the contributions you're trying to, you know, make to the world? Uh, yeah, I mean, upcoming, I've got um, uh, Dark Winds on AMC. Uh, I think June 12th is the premiere. I wrote episode five of that series. So that will, mm -hmm. my episode will be coming out later in the season. Um, I also wrote um, for season two on Reservation Dogs. I directed episode number three and I wrote episode number six. Um, so you can check out Reservation Dogs. Um, Fingers crossed the last bit of financing will come through for my feature film Fancy Dance, which I hope to be filming in Oklahoma this um, this August and September. So everybody just put out all your good energy that we get our financing so that we can make this movie with the incredible Lily Gladstone uh, uh, in the lead. And um, yeah, I mean, I in terms of like what folks can do to, to support, I, I, you know, I just don't think it's about me at all. Um, I would just say that, you know, I think for everyone to just like, you know, find that one thing that they want to, you know, work and focus on. And I think um, um, I'm, I'm just such a fan of, of, of authentic storytelling and like what other, of whatever format that it comes in. So I'm just, I'm just more excited to see the work coming from, from, from you and coming from everyone else. Like I'm just, the biggest fan of you, Lauren, and I just love watching <laughs> your star just rise. And I was so grateful for you reaching out and asking me to join you today. Um, anytime that I'm able to have conversations with other artists and um, it's just always such a, a, a pleasure and a treat. So I'm just so grateful um, to have been here uh, and share the space with you today. So uh, yeah, I, I, that's, that's it. Yeah, no, I, I'm just, I, I'm so happy. And it's so cool just hearing everything. I mean, hearing your story gives me inspiration because you're saying, and then I got a management. I'm like, I cannot find management to save my life. <laughs> I can't be tamed. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, you know, for me, like, you know, it's just so, I, I'm just so happy to like, you know, run, in, run back into you to cross paths again. Um, please, everyone, uh, Erica Tremblay, uh, follow Erica J. Tremblay at, in the front of that at Erica J. Tremblay. Uh, definitely somebody to watch. Definitely uh, someone who has some really great stories to tell. Definitely somebody who is owning their story. Hey, thanks for watching. Follow along for more inspirational content.